Greetings, and today we're going to be looking at characters, how we represent them, what they look like on the wire, and a few fun facts about them. So let's get started. On the screen we have some text in yellow, which you might say is Arabic, and some text in green, which you might say is Chinese. What we're showing here is that the characters used to make up these two colored sections come from specific character sets. Just as the characters that I've used on the screen that aren't in the yellow and the green, the ones that I use come from the Latin character set. So how do we represent characters in comms? because comms is the way of communicating between two devices. So we have a difference in defining a character to how we encode that character into a mathematical representation and how we represent that in the wire as a set of signals. So first off, how would we define a character? We could define it as an ASCII character, an extended ASCII character, ASCII code pages, or as a Unicode character. And today, with the multilingual world that we have, a lot of characters uh, will be represented by the Unicode, certainly those that are in some of the languages that have a lot of characters in their alphabets. How do we encode these? Well, we can encode them as a single byte, double byte, or between a single and a quad byte. Single bytes would be perhaps our ASCII characters because we only need a single byte for them, double byte for all the Unicode characters. And when we take the Unicode characters, put them through the uh, a transformation and mathematical algorithm, we end up with the UTF system and that system will define it as one or four bytes. Remember this is how we are going to encode it mathematically. This does not define where the character sits. So UTF-8 is not a definition of where the character is. How do we represent these characters in the wire? Well, the electrical signals are binary. They're either on or they're off. So we need to take the characters and represent them as a binary number. So we take the letter A and it has an ASCII value of 41 and that's a hexadecimal value because it's base 16. But we can convert that 41 into a binary number which is base 2 as we see here. And then we can say a signal is off or it is on, off when it's a zero, on when it's a one, for instance. And so this represents zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And so if we were to look at this signal on the oscilloscope, we would see something like that. Let's have a closer look at the character sets and how we were, were showing them. Here we're looking at the ASCII character set, which stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. So that's how we send it from one device to another device, developed in 63. And they used eight bits, it's really seven bits, uh, because they go from 00 to 7F, 00 down to 7F, which can be represented as seven bits. There are 128 different characters you can represent in here. You can count them all up. The first ones, you look at the purple ones. These are all non-printable. So these characters cannot be printed. Some people do represent them and sometimes you'll see things like smiley faces and arrows and stuff, but they aren't represented. Some of these are come from the typewriter era 
where you had things like a bell that would ring when you got to the end of the paper, and then you could do a line feed or a carriage return. Next stop, we'll look at where the numbers are. The numbers start at the hex value 30 for character 0. Character 4 is on hex value 34. So those amongst you have now realized if I said to you, what is the character represented by the hex value 38? You would take the three away and you'd be left with eight. And we'd see it's 38. So quite easy. We already know where all the numbers are in the ASCII character set and how to represent them with hex values. Next, we look at the uppercase. These in the green. Uppercase characters. Uppercase A starts at 41. B's at 42 and so on. So if I said to you what's at 45, you know what's at 41. You can count all the way up to 45 and you can see that you have the character uppercase E using the same values, but this time for the lower case, which starts at 61, that was 41, this is 61. We can work out all the lowercase characters. The more that you work with ASCII, you'll find things like a question mark, which is used at 3F, full stop at 3E, comma at 3C, and so on. Now, when we look at that character set, we say, yes, we can write some words, but you can't write them in, say, French or in German or Dutch, because there are some characters that are in your alphabet that aren't in this alphabet. So what happened next was that they moved from this 7-bit numbering system up to 7F, and they moved to an 8-bit numbering sense, uh, set. They duplicated the first set, so we have a second set starting here at 8-0, and the first few are non-printable. But we can see some of the characters that are used in these other language alphabets are in this one. So here we go from 0-0, we go all the way to sev, uh, to FF. Now, 00, zero is also a special character. It is a null character. It has nothing, no value associated with it. And that's one in comms that is used quite often. So now we've moved to an 8-bit character set and you've got all of the characters you need for your language in there. But along comes someone who uses the Cyrillic alphabet and they say, where are my characters? Or someone who uses the Greek alphabet, where are my characters? So to help those people, companies started to use what was called code pages. So we would still have the ASCII set up to 7F that we know, but we would remove that second set in the extended one, and we would replace it with, for instance, Cyrillic, as we see here or Greek. So how did we say which code page we were on? We gave them numbers. But as with a lot of things in, in history, you get two or three companies working on the same thing. They do things differently because there's no standard. So for instance, code page 437 in say Microsoft's set of tables will not be the same characters as IBM's code page 437 or indeed people like Oracle and so on. So you have to be very careful to know whose characters code pages you are using. This became quite difficult as computers became more and more useful around the world. And so in the mid 80s team got together and they formed the Unicode consortium where they were going to unify all of the world's written character sets into one big set with a unique definition of every single character. And so they went from the 8-bit, we move 8-bit, which is one byte, we move into two bytes now. So we could define a page, as in a book that has FF characters on it, 
but we can have FF pages, which gives us a total of 65,536 characters, each with a unique definition. So this means that we now move from the 8-bit to 16-bit, and we can define all of the world's characters. Now that we have a unique way of determining what the character is that we are using, let's look at how we now represent that mathematically. This is the encoding part. So if we use those earlier tables from the 60s, which are still used today, the ASCII tables, the letter A becomes 41, but this Chinese looking character here, we cannot represent as a single byte. So it has its drawbacks. So we moved over to double byte Unicode. Now we can represent this character A, which is on page 00, zero character A. Or we can re represent this Chinese looking character, page 4E, character 33, and we were all happy. But there are some other systems in the world uh, there's a couple in Japan where they used to represent the Japanese characters that they wanted to be backwards compatible. So the next thing that people came up with was this Unicode transformation format called UTF-8, which is backwards compatible for all of those other systems and can represent them in a different set of hex bytes. So we have the character A is at 0041, and we can represent that as, as we now know. Uh, in UTF-8, it becomes 41. But if we take the Unicode 4E33 for the Chinese character, with the UTF-8, it becomes three bytes. Now, these aren't so easy to work with because it doesn't tell you what page it is or what character it is, which you can see quite easily here. You have to put it back through this algorithm to transform it back into the raw Unicode. So all of these systems are useful for various things. You've just got to pick the right system you need for what you're doing. When we look at comms, we need the speed of getting stuff down a wire. If we're using the two byte Unicode system, that's only two bytes. If we start to use the UTF-8 system, we're getting three or maybe even four bytes, which takes a lot longer to send down, so isn't very efficient when we're using comms. As I say, we need to use the system that works best for us. Now, one of the other problems we have is that sometimes people will read those from left to right and sometimes they will read them from right to left it depends on the processor and this is called the endian this of the processor which end do you start reading from first so processors like the x86 uh, which is designed by intel or amd and most arm processors read from right to left as little endian so we're going to read them from right to left and character A, which we already know was page 00, character 41. In Little Endian, we write that as the character on the page. In Big Endian, we do it the opposite way round. These are used in Motorola processors and also used in the TCP IP networking. So here we will write the page first and then the character and it just depends which way round you, you, your processor reads as to how you're going to send this across. Now some processors like the ARM processor, it's a risk processor, reduced instructions processor, can be set to be either little endian or big endian. One of the most common mistakes that, that is made is that people get the endianness wrong and they will say, I sent down a particular set of characters to print, but I've printed a total different one. Well, if we wanted to send down to print this first character here, the Cherokee small letter we, 
we would have to send an AB, BA, but if we sent it down incorrectly, end in this, the BA first, then the AB, we would end up with the wrong character. So if you're printing the wrong characters, check your endianness is correct. There are some that are either way around, it doesn't really matter on those. If we take a 32-bit number, we take this very large number here, we convert it to hex. If we were to read it from the wrong way around, we would get a completely different number. But this is the same number, so we have to know which way to start reading it so that we end up with the correct number. And yes, some of you would have realized that you can make words out of hex characters, cool off being this big 32-bit number. So let's recap on what we've done. We've defined, we've looked at the definition of some standards and those we've looked at were ASCII, extended ASCII, ASCII code pages and Unicode. And we know that Unicode defines all of the world's written languages with a unique two byte number for every single one. When we look at how we going to, re to encode those into some maths, we can have single byte, two byte or multiple bytes. Single byte being used mostly for ASCII, two bytes for Unicode, and the multiple bytes for UTF-8, which is just a transformation of the Unicode values. We know to watch out for endianness, so we need to know what processor we're talking to, which way around it wants the bytes to arrive, big endian or little endian. That leaves us with a little test to check your knowledge, so good luck on that.